I'm thrilled to have um, one of my favorite CEOs and friends, Gary Watts, on the No Grow Scale podcast. It's kind of a long time coming. Should have interviewed you a long time ago because you are one of the uh, people that I would say is the most influential in my career. So I'm excited about getting to share your story with others. Um, I know it pretty well, but I think there are some things specifically in your story and your journey that I think every entrepreneur needs to hear because it's it's kind of, it's always resonated with me. So um, if you don't mind, founder and CEO of Fuse.Cloud, um, Gary Watts, if you don't mind, kind of give us and the listening audience a little uh, background into how you got to be the CEO at Fuse.Cloud today. Okay, let me think about that for a second. Um, Taking it all the way back. Yeah. I, I country, guess, boy, country boy from Mississippi? I don't know if you qualify as a country boy. <laughs> yeah. I guess, you know, there's always been something inside me that's been entrepreneurial. Um, I worked my way through college, and I say that very loosely because my we were very fortunate and blessed that my dad actually paid for our college. So it wasn't like I worked my way through college to pay for college. I just worked my way through. And when I say we, I have a twin brother. So that's yeah. why I say one. So you identify as one sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but, you know, looking back, that was really, that was a real important thing in my life. I mean, I, I yeah. didn't understand how fortunate I was. I mean, we really, I mean, we never really wanted for anything, needed for anything, I guess, growing up. Uh, but to have him with twins and he was retired, he retired in 1983 and we didn't start college till 83 to right. be able to write a check for both of us at the same time every semester that's pretty impactful you know right and, right uh, uh, very, i don't very think you realize that until you have children of your own you realize how yeah. how expensive it is and how much of a sacrifice it is to be able to do that yeah so um but anyway while i was in college i went to work for a, a, a friend of our church who owned a couple of dairy queen stores um and uh he just needed somebody that he trusted, I guess, to kind of work there and lock up or whatever. And um, <clears throat> very quickly, I was given the opportunity to kind of manage one of those stores and then eventually both of them while I was in, in, in college. And um, it was very, uh, I learned a tremendous amount of things through that experience, but it kind of gave me some exposure to the entrepreneurial lifestyle and um uh, I guess that's what really, you know, motivated me. So when I graduated college, I went to Mississippi College and graduated <clears throat> college. And, you know, my GPA, I, I don't even know what it was. It was probably somewhere around three, maybe a little lower because I was working 60 or 70 hours a week. I really didn't really focus. Right. <clears throat> I really didn't focus on academics. But I did go to class and, you know, I finished. But, um, you know, the only thing I really knew was life in the Dairy Queen business. And it just so happened that... I, that a Dairy Queen store became available for sale um, um, about the same time I was getting married and graduating college and all that. And so, you know, I don't know how it all happened. I'm sure there's some divine intervention, but but I was able to go to the SBA, borrow some money, you know, sign a lease on this brand new Dairy Queen stores in Rain, Mississippi. And at 23, I was on and operating a Dairy Queen store. And uh, I thought, you know, that, that probably, probably, I thought, man, this has put me ahead of everybody, you know, right. I mean, <laughs> that was, uh, that was not, that was a myth, but, uh, Do you feel that, like you recognized at that time, how big of a risk it was that you were taking, you know, I, just, I, I don't think I was, I don't think I knew any better. I mean, I just right. assumed that it would figure out a way to pay everything back. And, uh, right. So over the next 10 years, I don't mean risk as in it was a risk, but like taking out a loan at 23 like that to start a business, like that's a very much a mark of entrepreneur, you know, entrepreneurial uh, spirit. Yeah, I remember this was 1988, right? 88, no, 89, May of 89 is when I did this. So um, it, I don't remember the SBA loan was $210,000. That's a Which lot of back then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was because now I, I, the only way I, I was able to do it, it was the land in the building I was leasing from the guy that built it. And the okay. situation with the lady I bought it from, she had lost her husband to a heart attack um, a few minutes into the thing. He knew that he didn't have a, 
a good shot with her probably because she yeah. didn't have the desire or vision to want to do it. Right. And then right. with me, at least I had some experience in the business and, you know, young right. and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, that everything kind of lined up for me to be able to do it. But, but anyway, the next 10 years, I own and operate that Dairy Queen. Now what, what's interesting about that to me is it was in a community college town, you know, Raymond is like, um, got one of the largest community colleges in the state in mm -hmm. that town. And it was right before they started diversifying campuses and started mm -hmm. throwing people around to different areas around the, the area. And so, you know, almost immediately, most of my customer base weren't driving past the store anymore. Oh, uh, yeah. They were going to Vicksburg or they were going to the Jackson branch or they were going to Rankin branch and things that they, and so that was really a challenge because Raymond was like this little bedroom community of 2,500 people. And so, uh, it, which is not large enough to support something like that. that. Right. But for some, somehow I, I struggled through the lat the, for 10 years and I, I ran that business and, um, um, I, I, you know, you get one of those social security things in the mail saying, how you doing on social security? And I can look back on some of those years. There's two years in a row. I had zero and yeah. zero income. Now I'm sure I had some expense car expense or whatever that were, right. it, you know, it was very challenging. And, and so I ended up l leaving the business in 1997, 98, I sold it or actually just gave it away. And, um, um, but when I did, I owed about 200 grand. So it was kind of like. It was all a wash. <laughs> well, like, I, still, like, I still owed 200 grand, right? So it's 10 years. I still owed. So I had to figure out how to do it. But, but uh, you know, that's just life. I mean, and, and, you know, by the grace of God, we somehow paid that back over the years with my next season of life. I went into um, just a regular sales job for a for, uh technology company that actually sold phone service and um, um, kind of worked my way through that company up through that company and was able to make enough money to help pay that back and, um, you know and by the time I got all that done you know it gave me an opportunity to learn the technology business but I knew that I never wanted to stay working for somebody else I always wanted to that's what I was going to ask so when you went from 10 years as you know owning your own business even though it was had had highs and lows which it all does and then you go to work for somebody else you knew from day one this was not going to be long term necessarily yeah, but, but it was but it was a necessary break because right. I was going working 12 14 hours a day and leaving right. dollars at the door every day to right actually then um working for somebody and getting a paycheck, you know, right. I think, it's probably I think when they hired me at this little telecom company in 98, 97, I think I, I think my salary was $18,000, which, you know, that sounds like nothing now. And it wasn't a whole lot then, but it was 18,000 more than I had, than I was. Right. Making, right. Know? And then I got right. commission on top of that. And blah, blah, blah. Right. So, it was a needed break to have the pressure of that off of me and have actually income coming in. But, you right. know, I did that from 1997 to about 2005 uh, because I just had opportunities to grow within that company. But I knew yeah. deep down that I probably would always want to do my own thing. But I needed that that eight years of experience Season. in the right. world to understand what I wanted to do. Right. So what was the catalyst that moved you back into having your own business and how to fuse that cloud and get it start? Well, I was working for this technology company. They had just, we had, we had played around with voice over MP as a product back in the early two thousands. And uh, I kind of, uh, the time we started playing around with, it, I was kind of the vice president of sales of this company. So I had, we had a lot of markets around the country that I was responsible for and, and really product development kind of fell with me too, because um, it just did. And, um, this, this company, you know, had had uh, bought a bunch of uh, paging companies around the country to try and implement additional products into those customer bases and, and basically, you know, borrowed way too much money, got upside down, and I knew the company would never become solvent. Yeah. And so yeah. um, I started thinking about, okay, I could stay here and continue to get a paycheck till they close the door or I can be proactive in trying yeah. to to do something on my own. So 
Mississippi hadn't yet started selling the voiceover IP product. Nobody was really marketing or selling it. So I saw that as an opportunity to raise a little money and, and start doing that uh, on, on our own. So that's how we started the company in 2005. I also saw an opportunity that a lot of the people in this industry, the at ts of the world, um, were walking away from relationship with the customer. And so mm-hmm. it just made sense to me if we could create a company with the right new innovative product and be very relational with that with that company. Mm-hmm. I mean with that mm-hmm. product that we could probably be pretty successful at it. Yeah. So I like to whenever I do interviews talk about the three phases of your business. So the no phase, which is where you're figuring out who you are the grow phase, which is when you know who you are and you're actually like starting to, to trend in the right direction. And then the scale phase is when you have the peop- right people in the right seats and you're growing um, at a predictable pace. So um, I know the story of in the no phase taking a little pivot um, from a name change perspective, but I tell your story a lot because I think that it's very um, a very good reminder that where you start isn't always um, a good indicator of where you're going to end up. So kind of taking a little pivot, but can you talk through the name change and how that came to be just so, um, we can kind of walk through that because, you know, changing a name is also very, I would say from a leadership standpoint is something that people usually shy away from just because, well, this has always been our name, but it's, it's proven to, I think, help your business. So talk through that a little bit. Uh, Yeah. Let me get to that. I, I think it's important though to kind of say this, I think anytime you start a business in technology, you assume the exit is probably sooner than it really is. Does that make sense? Okay. And yeah. so yeah. You, know, you start, I started this thing in 06 and I thought, you know, in five years we'll have a big fun booming business and hopefully, and then it'd be worth something. We can sell it, you know, right. and then go on to the next thing. And it very rarely works like that. I've learned. Right. right. Really, right. you can take a lot more money than you think and a lot longer to become valuable or, or whatever. But, yeah, that's um, good. Yeah. I, I think that I think that we felt like we were going to be a voice or IP company. We learned very quickly that people in this in this space wanted products. Customers wanted products bundled together. Um, mm-hmm for a long time and it's a lot a lot like this with with, with wireless now today you know the, the people that own that infrastructure really are not allowing a bunch of people uh, to be competitive with selling it directly so right now there's a lot of agent programs and stuff with with wireless to where you could kind of get you know one time money if you help them sell it or whatever but you can't actually wholesale it from them mark it up and sell it and it was a lot like that with internet access back in, in, in when we started the company. There was not a lot of options for us to make a lot of money on on internet service. You know, back when we started, a T1, which is 1.54 megabits speed, okay, was the standard. And yeah. so there's very little margin in it. You know, if you if you got with AT&T, yeah. they might would let you make 15% or something, but but right. it'd be big enough and I was small and all that kind of stuff. But there came a point in time where, where there's a, there, the end, the, there's par- paradigm shift in the industry where they understood companies like us that did focus on relationships would really be best for them because there's mm-hmm. no way that they had the ability to, to manage the customer in a relational way. So, mm-hmm. you know, two or three years in, we saw that shift and, and we were able to start reselling internet at a market, at a, at a profit margin. That was very, very important for the life of the company because not only did it add good cash flow when we sold that and, and you know, more revenue and all that kind of stuff, but it became we became competitive with their retail side. Mm-hmm. Um, so to the name change, so now we're not just selling voice over IP, which our first company name was Broadband Voice. The reason mm-hmm. I chose that name was because I'd come from a company the, the previous eight years that had a very uh, uh, generic name that really didn't define anything. Okay. So broadband voice defined what we were going to do. Well, now we've added fiber or internet access or what do you want to call it? So it's really, it still kind of defines it because broadband is internet voice is voice, you know, but at some point we started doing a lot of different things other than that 
um, that was outside of those two products because, our, again, our relational nat nature with our customers uh, lended itself to them asking us for a lot of different things. So we were able to develop other ancillary products, and we were losing out on some of those uh, those opportunities because they didn't think of us because our name defined voice more than anything else. And so that's when we came to a, a, a decision. We probably need to do a name change. There's a couple other factors um, then with some web domains and stuff like that, 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 that contributed. But I think the biggest thing is, okay, what can we name the company that will totally encompass the company for the life of the company as we add products as technological advances? Right. Right. And do you feel like that's proven to have been a good decision? Yeah, I think, I think it was absolutely the right decision. You know, um, it, we timed it and you were part of this, this process, but we timed it to where, you know, the dot, dot cloud domain, it just became come available. So we were able to, to have kind of first pickings over names with that extension, right. which allowed us to do a, a name that was short enough, not only to encompass what we do, which fuse.cloud would basically define as, you know, aggregating cloud-based products all together, fusing them yeah. together. And so yeah. we have, we have, uh, done our best to brand ourselves as the whole name fuse.cloud. That's our domain name. That's our company name. That's our email address. That's, and, and I think that's, that was, that was brilliant and genius, which you were a huge part of that. That was, well, that was really on the early stages of, and I think, you know, nod to you to, to recognize it, but for the only early stages of people kind of getting away from a traditional dot com. Right. I mean, you had a dot, you had a dot org or a dot edu or maybe a dot gov, but nobody was using the dot co's or the you know dot clouds or anything like that. So I think that um, you know a lot of people are using dot ai now or dot io. So I think that well, and I will say this too. I mean, I think that I think it's it, it's been you, you've got to take be a risk taker, an entrepreneurial person to even make a decision like that because we right. have we have experienced some difficulty early on where. Our, our emails were rejected. Right, you know, right. People just didn't do the work they should have on their end to add those right. extensions to their systems or whatever. Right, we, right. We, we weathered that storm, and now you know it's, it's commonplace. And it's common. uh, right, but, right. But we do have a very, I think, uh, recognizable brand and a very manageable one where it's you know it's nine letters. So right. So it's easy to to find us in, in those times. Right. You know, I'm right. st still struggling, and you'll laugh. We're still struggling with people, you know, just calling us views or calling yeah. us out or whatever. And I don't know that we can do a whole lot about. I don't I know. Think I think if we yeah. threw the dollars at it, it wouldn't change. I know. I think about when I when you say that, I think about my brother moved to South Louisiana, and his name, you know, his whole life has been Micah, and he moved to home in Louisiana, and everybody's calling him Mike. He's been Mike, <laughs> and I don't think that's changing, and it doesn't have much to do with him or his name, but you know, that's, that's just how it is. So, yeah. well, um, okay. So let's kind of shift to the grow phase of the business. Like once you established your brand and started to really kind of, um, get some momentum, what are some highs and lows that you can, um, kind of mark during that growth? Like what are some hard, you know, maybe a hard hiring decision or a hard firing decision, or, cause I feel like kind of the, the, one of the biggest challenges for entrepreneurs during that growth phase of business is personnel or as people. Um, and maybe it's other things, maybe it's, you know, weighing the the right hire at the right time or um, growing a certain department. Do you have any kind of like things that come to mind during, during the growing well, yeah, business? We'll talk, uh, we'll talk about, you know, people in a second. I, I think that, I think that one of the biggest challenges was, trying to find enough resource to keep things going because it's always going to be more expensive than you think. And so there are yeah. a couple of key times in our, in the life of our company where cash was running out. And so I had to totally focus on how do I continue to fund this? Um, and, and so you got to be real creative in that because the banks didn't, doesn't really understand a recurring revenue model. They understand mm -hmm. an asset based model, you know, so, mm -hmm. Um, if I want to go out there and buy a bunch of commercial buildings, I'd have a better chance to raise it. That makes more sense. Right. right. Sense to them. They didn't really understand a cash, you know, a recurring right. revenue model. So I had to get real creative and, um, you know, uh, 
kind of share some equity with people to raise money. Mm-hmm. Some very creative mm-hmm. ways. So that was that was <clears throat> one of the most challenging things that that I experienced. But but you know it it um, it happened. I mean you know it, it took some effort, but you know those things there always seemed to be the right person at the right time, um, right to come along and be a part of what we do. One of the really biggest blessings of this has been the people that have come in our path that have become part of it have not interfered with the management of the company, which has allowed us to, I think, grow um, Yeah. because I'm not trying to, to, to satisfy or appease a bunch of investors that want to be involved in the day to day thing. Mm-hmm. I think the biggest thing to them that was, you know, if, if they continue to see the, you know, the revenue grow, then yeah. something right. And eventually they know that they'll get some, dip, you know, some dip, some benefit. Right. So that, that was, that's, that was a huge thing. Um, challenge from a people perspective you know we've had some challenges i mean um i I would say this anytime i threw a lot of money at somebody that's been in the industry a long time that i felt like would have an immediate impact on my growth i don't think it's worked out one time yeah yeah and you think you would learn your lesson for that but then there's always the next i mean i got a call i got a call last night from somebody that I've had some conversations with that really, really wants to be a part of what we're doing. And, you know, I'm considering, okay, should we give this a shot or not? But it seems like any time we've done that, we have not got any return on that investment. Right. So we, right. That's been the industry thing. Maybe it's just a, you know, region, regional thing. Who knows? But I, yeah, I see I that. I don't know. I mean, you've been a part of some of those conversations. I yeah. feel like that there, and mostly what I'm talking about is on the sales side. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. From an I think any entrepreneur would agree too. sales headcount and churn and, or overturn, you know, overturning and, and sales is, is the number one place where you've got it the most. I yeah. Think. The operational side has just, and, and I hear again, we've been very, very blessed in that we've gotten really the right people in right. the operation side and they have, and they, and they're long-term people now. Right. And we don't have a lot of turnover and da, 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 da. but on right. the sales side, throwing money at somebody hadn't, hadn't been the answer. Yeah. So we're yeah. still trying to figure out how do we get this to a hyper growth, you know, right mode. Yeah. Without, yeah. with being good stewards of the resources we have. Right. Something that, right. Um, you know, I struggle with even, even today, but, um, but we have had good steady growth. I mean, and even, even with all that, and we've been, yeah. We haven't had to borrow money to throw, throw at people. We've had right. to produce, but right. I think that, you know, that's kind of still a, a, a puzzle that we're trying to put together. Right. Okay. So what are you most excited about the next, you know, you said it takes longer than you think it's going to. So maybe it's the next 10 years, maybe, maybe it's not, but what are you excited about looking forward? Well, you know, we talked a little bit about the name change and that's given us an opportunity to add products. And I think the, the kind of the third leg of the stool, here we've got voice and we've got fiber. We've added a, a managed IT services product that really excites me about the growth opportunity. In fact, this week I've been to two really big meetings uh, on potential customers for that product because I think you know people are changing their mindset on how to approach managing their internal IT. Instead of hiring one guy that sits in the corner that has all your passwords that might get hit by a bus. They're right. looking to outsourcing that to companies that have teams of people that might have a more efficient approach. I think it becomes more economical for them, which is very, very um, compelling. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that's exciting to me. And I feel like that that's going to kind of be the product that leads us into the next five years. And the other two products will come along with that. I think if, yeah. if we've had any struggle with the other two products, it's been, we'll get really close to closing a deal and then their IT guy will step in and right. kind of move the water a little bit. Right. If we right. become that IT guy, I think that right. we, we can help grow the other products too. Because really, it is really what's best for the customer, in my opinion, to have yeah. all of in one basket, have one throat to choke, have yeah. not people pointing fingers at each other. Oh. And the resources that Fuse.Cloud has available to the customer versus one man or one woman. 
Um, you know, I'm in a similar boat on the marketing side where, you know, I think, and I, I feel like if I had one message to a CEO from a marketing standpoint, I, I usually will leave, you know, a conversation with this. It is not realistic, realistic for a business owner to expect one person to have the breadth of knowledge. You know, I, I think now, especially in marketing, same with IT, You've got search engine optimization, staying top of search in Google. You've got website development. You've got graphic design. You've got, you know, content creation. Like there's, it's very unlikely that there's one person, you know, a marketing coordinator with a few years out of college experience that has the, that's an expert in all those things. Right. And I think we need to be more realistic as business owners about, as we grow about what IT what is realistic of an IT person. That doesn't mean there can't be somebody in house to help coordinate, but they, they can't have all the answers and all the skills. Right. So it I think really, it really to takes a lot of pressure off that right. person in that company too, because right. you said, you know, just like you have the ability to go find the, the best marketing CEO person or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The other, the, the other guy, the one person shop, that, that's in that company is their heads down all the time. So they can't. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. I think it works both. Updating ways. software licenses. Like that's a full-time job right there. You know? exactly. Absolutely. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. One thing I want to just make sure I bring up is you have always done a good job of finding, you know, continuing to develop and grow in areas that you're passionate about outside of work. And you, to a point where you have developed an entire successful concert series locally that, that benefits um, local ministries um, by doing what you love in music and also bringing that, um, honestly, bringing businesses in the community into it. And I think that it's, and I want to just kind of hear it, even, even when you said you were working at, at your full-time job before you started this, you had a music side gig, right? Or side hustle. Right. So I think that it's important to, for any business owner to know that just because, you know, and I, I interviewed Carl Falk um, at BotDoc, another client of mine, um, because he also, you know, ha he's very passionate about um, a lot of different things. And he also, you know, introduces me to other clients of his that are or other people that, you know, his CFO is also working with other companies. And I think that not having boundaries, I'm making a point here, but not having defined boundaries mentally of what's acceptable um, to do and work. You know, it, I think that it's good to be open-minded about that. So talk a little bit about how you've like continued to hone in on your passion of music and connecting people because both of those things you're good at and what you're doing at Covered. Well, I, you know, I think it's really important to, um, I, well, for me, it's really important because I don't want to define anybody else. Right. You don't focus all of your energy on one thing. Yeah. I've, got, I've got friends, acquaintances in, in businesses that I have watched that everything they're about is about that business. And maybe yeah. that's what it takes for them. But I think that if you really dug down deep, they're probably miserable at some level. Right. Right. Because I think I think we're we're created as as human beings to be well rounded mm -hmm. and not all about one particular thing. I don't know how healthy that can be. But you know, if it works for somebody, you know, I don't want to be judgmental of that. I'm just saying for me, I've got to have other things in my life that help balance what I do at work. That doesn't mean I don't really like what I do. I, I very much do. And it has right. a lot to do with the people that are here, you know, but um, and my customers and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, music's always kind of been a part of me. And um, when I was doing the Dairy Queen business and losing a lot of money, I had a little side business promoting events around the country and it grew very quickly. And, but I had to do something to offset the negative income. And so I, yeah. um, I, I ended up promoting mostly Christian events and, and, uh, uh, and, and surviving through that. But it was something I love to do. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it was interesting. I'll, I'll never forget this. I was in a hotel 
in, in Arkansas. Have I ever told you this story? I don't know if I have or not. I've been in a hotel in Arkansas after being on the road 10 or, 10 or 12 days. And, and uh, um, my daughter was probably two years old or something at the time because I started, started doing the, the event business in 93 and kind of co-managing it with the Dairy Queen. And um, uh, I um, found myself on an off day in Bentonville, Arkansas or something. And I almost wept all day because I was miserable because I had taken a passion of mine and, and tried to make it a vocation. And, and this really, really influential, great friend of mine looked at me and she said, sometimes your passion or your calling in life is not your vocation. Well, no, no. She said, sometimes it can be your vocation. Mm -hmm. And her husband's a pastor, and for him, his calling and vocation is the same thing. But mm -hmm. for most people, it's not. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So that's really what I felt I was called to do. Mm -hmm. To make it my full-time job made me miserable. That's where the poll was, yeah. yeah. And so I think that you've got to understand calling and vocation and the differences and determine what's best for you and for me i feel like doing something with music and people and community and calls is a calling yeah so for me to be able to to explore um growing that or being a part of that has kind of been the most motivation for me to do what we've, what we've done with this little concert series yeah little concert series you're being humble, but it's turned into a great, it's, it's impacted a lot of people I know. And that's why it's, you know, I think that people not only love the music part of it, but love that it means more than just, you know, going to a concert. So, but I think that that is a great lesson and kind of something we can end on, but to, to an entrepreneur to really any entrepreneur that's listening or anybody that's in, you know, a corporate setting, maybe that's trying to figure out, you know, is this really what I want to do for the rest of my life? Or is this just something that I'm doing in this season because it makes sense um, for different reasons? I think that it's it's important to really think about what our calling is. You know, I actually struggle a lot with reading business books. Um, I've never, you know, I, I, for whatever reason, and I do, I read them because I feel like I need to be a better business person. I can always improve but i would if i'm going to spend time reading and i'm gotten into listening now but i like to read books that take my mind away from right. <laughs> business right. so you know it's one of those things that i feel like i'm supposed to do um but really my passion is you know I, i'm passionate about lots of things but but i want to um to to be able to escape sometimes the, the task list and and with reading or movies or whatever you know so i think that it kind of um, realizing that it doesn't always have to be one or the other is, is a good thing. So, well, thank you for your insight. I know a lot of people will really um, benefit from listening to this. Again, it's been a long time coming and I really appreciate you taking the time to, to sit on this interview. So thank you very much. And where could people find if they're looking for fuse.cloud? I know this, I can actually tell them. Um, <laughs> if you're looking to learn more about fuse.cloud, www.fuse.cloud or all of our handles on social media is at Fuse DOT Cloud. So if you want to learn more about what Gary's doing at Fuse.Cloud, you can look him up there. Yeah, also give him the, uh, the Covered website. Oh yeah, and Covered-Music.com is where you can learn about the concert series that he started. So. All right, well, thanks all for right. having me. Thank you.